Fob still. Hold on. Hold on, boys. What if we just do go out to the gym right now? Uh, chat. We got it. We got it, dude. We can go right now. I still have the fob, bro. I, I, dude, I don't don't ask me why, but for some reason I had two memberships at the same time. I had to cancel one of them. Dude, I can still go. They charged me the thirty dollars, dude, of the month. So I could probably still go. We could show up there. Uh, hit a couple lifts, dip, successful stream. Let's work out our music taste. Guys, guys, what the hell? Think about it. We can go there, and then let's see here. We go there. Maybe, I mean, I already hit bands. We'll do something. We'll figure something out there. We'll do some squats. I know you guys probably have been waiting for a minute to see me do squats. You, Joe. But with wait, is this, wait, wait, we literally started right here. Okay, we still got the rest of this video. Guys, we need, we need to finish the rest of the video, bro. We have to. That's a must. Without a proper plan, the situation quickly grew helpless and trapped beneath that dirt. Surround Do a two minute wall sit, no balls? Bro, I 1 million percent can do that. Like, guys, wall sits are kind of dumb. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. Wall sits are dumb. Matter of fact, I'll do it while I'm, I'm watching this video. I'll literally do it right now. Two minute wall sit? Let's, let's start the timer. What the hell? Um, okay. Ready? AFK. Okay, ready? Let me get a two minute timer. Let me move that move that cam over here. Two minute timer. Okay. Ready? I'm gonna reset it. Don't do wall sits to people dying. Listen, I'm call I, this is why I'm a multitask streamer. Okay. The wall sit let me get into position. Legs at 90 degrees. Okay. I'm already started. Hold on. It's not tracking. Okay. I'm starting it. Guys. Guys. By cheering fans, Why is this way harder than I thought it was going to be? In a TV camera, the amazing Joe would lose his life. Ironically, within a coffin buried six feet under. Todo ocurrió cuando estábamos en el la hija de Emilio y Maritza. Sporting Pulse events are no stranger shit, to disturbing on, TV so. moments. From hockey players having their throats cut open. Holy shit, no. Yo, guys, guys, guys. Ecto told me a story where there was a kid. I think it was from his high school or high school near. And, um... He, he said a kid fell and it's and he got yes his the kid fell and, the, and like there's an ice skate i can't even think right now dude a skate sliced his fucking throat bro and it was like a horrible thing the whole town had this huge funeral down the thing it was a horror story He's cut wide open. to a football player suffering cardiac arrest right there oh, on yep. the field i've seen they this they have been administering cpr through these past i've only had a minute right now breaks that we've taken it's unfortunately always a risk in practically any televised sport out there and although there's always a lingering chance that at any moment things could go terribly wrong okay. that risk mainly pertains to the players guys. actually participating actually in the sport and you likely wouldn't have i actually give up guys i give up i have like 40 seconds left i give up bro you were so close, bro. No, I put, dude. It literally felt like I couldn't take it anymore. Who wants to see the leg pump? Dude, I'll throw on the special shorts, guys. I'll throw them on. Wow, dude, let's just keep it a buck fifty today. Let's just keep, let's just keep it up, dude. Being your genius, dude. My quads are pumped out of my fucking mind. Holy shit! Thank you, Bean. I appreciate that, brother. I had no definition before I did these. imagine fans being in any sort of danger as they sit by and watching the game though sadly it does happen from time to time with perhaps See, the most notable example <laughs> right. being the story of shannon stone 
Shannon was a 39-year-old firefighter who, on the 7th of July, 2011, took his son Cooper to watch a Texas Rangers game. Also, so Arlington. fun and volleyball practice. This was the per How the fuck do people do do wall sits? Guys, I can't do it. I have leg day tomorrow, buddy. I have leg day tomorrow. Okay. I can't do it. I cannot do it. I have I have, I have too much to do tomorrow for legs. Okay. We can't waste our time doing this. Perfect bonding opportunity. For Guys, for duo. leg day right now, for real. Guys, I'm doing squats. Okay, I'm not doing. I'm not doing anything for muscle endurance. I'm doing stuff to get stronger and bigger. Okay. And an even better opportunity to catch fly balls. As Let me turn this off. My bad. Prime position to take home an unforgettable souvenir. The two would even stop at a sporting store beforehand, where Shannon would buy his son a baseball glove to use in the event that a loose ball came flying their way. And as the game reached the top of the second inning, their moment had finally arrived. Being they're not the best way the of building ball muscles, was hit though. In their general direction, being quickly recovered by Rangers outfielder Josh Hamilton. And rather than returning the ball to the dugout or the field itself, Hamilton decided to make Cooper's day, recognizing the young fan in the stands and subsequently tossing they're pretty good, the ball though. to they're good, though. As this was all transpiring, the game continued with the pitcher preparing for his next throw. Before suddenly, you can hear the sound of something strange. Wait, was this the one where the guy tried catching the ball? Like, there's this video of this guy that tried catching like a a ball for his kid, and he fucking dropped down, dude. It was it was it's one of the craziest videos. <gasps> no. What just happened? CPR. Blind but foul. I, when I looked at who the A's are facing. A foul ball was hit in their general direction, being quickly recovered by Rangers outfielder Josh Hamilton. And rather Good than shit. returning the ball to the dugout or on, the Alex. field itself, Hamilton decided to make Cooper's day, recognizing the young fan in the stands and subsequently tossing the ball to Shannon. As this was all okay, transpiring, the game <laughs> continued with the pitcher preparing for his be. next throw, before suddenly you can hear the sound of something strange. I want them to be great in their last. What's going on, Ike, though? It almost seemed like yelling, which was followed by some sort of strong reaction from the crowd, which in turn led to Wait, a what? stoppage of play, as the announcers were left trying to figure out what exactly was happening, until they finally received word on the unfolding situation. <laughs> I wish Brody, Brody did sleep streams. Guys, should I really do sleep streams? Yo, Ecto, is that your new album cover? What's going or thing? Yo, what's going on, Alex? What's going on, everybody? Sorry if I'm not talking to the chat as much, guys. This video, this video, I gotta lock in. I gotta lock in. Sleep stream, guys. I'll do a 24 hour one of these days, okay? The thing is, okay, <sighs> bro. Well, if I did a 24 hour, I gotta figure out when I should do it, though. <sighs> it's just words, maybe. Okay, okay. Got a lot of energy built up. I think somebody fell out of the stands in left field trying to. Uh, no way. No way. Well, this is it. <laughs> no, bro. They even showed it. That's why there was time taken. Wow. The man in this footage was, in fact, Shannon Stone. And as Josh Hamilton had gone to toss the ball up to him, the throw fell just a bit short, causing the 39 year old father to extend past the railing before losing his balance. And despite the seemingly playful nature of the announcers at the time, you were right, Ray. Somebody did tumble. <laughs> this fall was no laughing matter, as below that railing stood a 20 foot fall directly onto a concrete floor, which Shannon would strike. I've first. watched this before. As he laid there on the ground, barely able Shut to move, the, morning, uh, the man was miraculously still conscious. No, bro. He had the fall on his face, though, bro. He literally went down. You know what I mean? He literally went down into the thing, like face first, or like hit it, dude. Hit his chin, hit his neck, something, buddy. It's, it might be raps for this guy. Finding the strength to tell the rescue team carrying him out, please check on my son. My son was up there all by himself. Based on this reaction, what a good dad. it was clear w that Stone dad. was obviously alive and had clear brain function, making his initial prognosis on the scene somewhat promising. But before he would even reach a nearby hospital, Shannon Stone would be pronounced 
dead. Shit. According to many medical professionals, this immediate showing of brain function was more or less a fluke occurrence, and something they call a lucid interval, which is a window of conscious clarity after a traumatic injury. Essentially meaning that- Yo, is this the same thing, Chad? I was reading this one thing today. Apparently, like, p patients that are, like, terminally ill, like, cancer patients that have, like, terminal cancer, like, they, you know what I mean, the worst stage, I guess, or whatever, they, they have, like, this sudden burst of energy right before they die, dude. It's insane. Like, they'll be like, oh, let's go out shopping, let's do this, and then, like, after that, they'll go to sleep, and they'll never wake up again. It is the weirdest phenomenon that goes on, but our bodies literally give you a burst of energy before you die. And although his ability to move and speak seemed to be a positive indicator, it was instead a sign that the injuries his brain had suffered were going to be fatal. Mm. In the years since, Shannon Stone's memory lives on with a statue being made in his honor in that very stadium where his life came to an Yo, that, end. That's awesome, man. Wow. W Stadium. Dude, that's crazy. I feel bad for the son. I feel bad for the family. That is horrible. This is a horrible situation. Uh, Terminal lucidity. Is that what it's called? Wait, wasn't it just, wasn't it just called lucidity? Something lucidity? Damn, it's like the same shit then, right? Uh, this was the same thing. Damn. Damn, mental issues and shit. So it's literally the same thing. Damn. Add fucking railings. They did have railings, but he's a tall guy. I mean, if you look at the footage, this guy is tall as shit. But you, you mean even more, but this guy, you couldn't even... If they had more railings, you can't really see the game. So this just has to be a tall guy. Or it needs to be... Yeah, maybe it should be taller. Maybe it should, like, add one more little thing up here. One more. Bump it up just by one. Shannon Stone, and as Josh Hamilton had gone to toss the ball up to him, the throw... He did that, the, he literally... Cut, dude, he died the... That makes me feel so bad, man. Literally, he wanted to get his son a gift. It's like a baseball from a baseball player, buddy. And he, dude, that is just insane. That is just insane. ...saying that the injuries his brain had suffered were going to be fatal. In the years since, Shannon Stone's memory lives on with a statue being made in his honor in that very stadium where his life came to an end, forever immortalizing someone who, by all accounts, was a great man and an even better father. Electric is wild, it is. We don't see or hear anything. The end of Catch a Predator? Wait, what? If Chris Hansen? If you any considerable amount of time here on YouTube, then chances are you're at least somewhat familiar with the show To Catch a Predator. Mm -hmm. During its run on Dateline, the show was incredibly popular, with its host Chris Hansen being launched into stardom for his role exposing pedophiles on the internet. How you doing? Right, you have a seat over in that chair, please. At the Damn. time, there was really nothing else like this on TV. <laughs> dude, I love the way he just tells people to sit the fuck down, dude. The cops are waiting in the garage and shit. Like, it's the craziest setup, man. You know, Skeet or Gene Skeeter, whatever his name is, he could never do this like Chris Hansen did back in the day. Dude, as one of the most entertaining shows out there, which has caused it to find a second life here on YouTube, as re-uploads of its episodes have been viewed as many as 50 million plus Dude, these times. videos are huge. To this day, the show what remains the immensely fuck? popular, and during its television run, the same was true, which led me to wonder how or why it was ever taken off the air. I mean, it was entertaining, popular, and with the mm. internet exploding in recent years, the content would seemingly be endless. Yet somehow, True. this show only lasted three years. And that's when I realized that there's actually a very specific reason why oh, the Predator was pulled from the air. And it's one of the darker TV stories I've ever heard. During happened? the fall of 2007, Perverted Justice, the team that To Catch a Predator used to find their predators, had set up a decoy account on MySpace, posing as a 13-year-old boy. And before long, another user had taken the bait, reaching out to the fake child in the hopes of sparking an intimate Holy relationship. Shit. According to the user's account, he was a 19-year-old college student that happened to live in the same area. However, upon doing some light digging, the perverted justice team discovered that the man was actually in his late 50s. His knew it, bro. 19 is just like that. I knew that was going to be a lie. Like, come on, bro. Like, if you're 19 year old, if you're 19 years old and you're going, that's just like you're you're a loser, bro. I'm gonna be honest. Like guys, you know how many women are just out there when you're like a teenager? Like, come on, buddy, you're really gonna be preying on little kids? Like you're just a loser. His name was Louis Condrat, and although his behavior was similar to essentially all other predators in the show's run, sending explicit messages and pornographic images, despite knowing he was speaking to a child, Louis was different in one respect. It seems that Condrat was in a position of power, working as a chief felony assistant district attorney for Rockwall County. This was setting up to be to catch a predator's biggest catch to date, and exposing him would not only mean bringing him to justice, 
but also bringing in great ratings for the show. Though there was one major issue, oh, shit. upon engaging the decoy for a few hours and even calling to speak to him, Hello? Hey, Will. Hey, what are you doing? Nothing. What are you doing? Nothing. No? No, I was looking up to see how to get to where you are. Still thinking about me? Yeah, where's your right hand? Um, it's in my pocket. In your pocket? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What are you doing with your right hand in your pocket? Lewis stopped responding Whoa. and seemed to recognize the grave error he was making and began deleting all content from his account. And as a few days passed, it was clear that Lewis was not going to be visiting their sting house, which meant no program and no justice. However, the To Catch a Predator team was not going to let this go easily, with the crew coming up with a plan that had never been done before in the history of the show. What the fuck? They were going to bring the program to Kondrat. And so on November 5th, Hansen and his crew would visit Kondrat's house with a group of officers and an arrest and search warrant. This would not be without controversy though, as the warrant supposedly contained wrong information like the wrong county and the wrong date, meaning that they oh, would likely shit. struggle to hold up in court and probably should have never been acted on. Despite this, the crew urged law enforcement to act anyway, rushing the ordeal to assure they got their guy. What the and so hell? the police agreed, first calling Kondrat and then knocking on his door for multiple hours, though neither attempt saw any results. And growing impatient with the whole ordeal, they then called in the SWAT team to surround and eventually breach the house, which they would do around 3 p.m., barging into the home and surrounding Kondrat at yeah. gunpoint. As this was all happening, To Catch a Predator had their cameras trained on the outside of the home, awaiting the shot of Kondrat being ushered into a cop car and driven away, unaware that this time, this is getting dark. things were going to end much differently. Inside, Kondrat would yell to the officers, I'm not gonna hurt anybody, before brandishing his pistol. And rather than pointing it at the officers, he instead Damn. pointed it at the guy's trying to kill you right, right act though. Right on, buddy. Officers line up in formation and head to the back of the house. They're, they aired this still? Nah. And then we hear a faint. They're crack. probably too too deep. They had to. The officers force their way in. For almost five minutes, we don't see or hear anything. Yeah. Then Lieutenant Adina Barber of the Murphy Police Department comes out yeah, and tells us what happened. As they made entry, they confronted the suspect. I believe he's in the hallway, and he told them he wasn't going to hurt them. And then and he had a pistol in his hand. Yeah. This single gunshot would essentially mark the end of To Catch a Predator, as in the time following, on, NBC Britain. would be hit with a $105 million lawsuit from Kondrat's own sister. And though this lawsuit was settled privately with undisclosed conditions, the show was already on death's door, which was not helped by the national media dogpiling on To Catch a Predator as well as perverted justice. But now there are serious questions about what goes on behind the scenes. Whose sting was this? Yeah. The police departments or the vigilantes hired by Dateline? You don't have the full transcripts? I don't know. That's exactly part he of the He doesn't fucking know. The police department can't tell me. What yeah, it's raps for this. Raps for the show. GG's. If you're arresting officers, did they see the chats before they made the arrest? In some cases, yes. Did they see the entire chats? No. Making it see, guys. This is a perfect example. When you get too greedy, you're gonna lose it all, buddy. You see what just happened? Do you see what just happened? They got way too greedy, tried changing it up on the show to really get this motherfucker and do it, get out of their comfort zone, get this crazy shot of a predator going into the cop van just for that. They, they pushed they pushed it too far, went a whole different level of what they usually go to, and they messed it up, and the whole show's canceled. Whole show was canceled. Says District Attorney Roach to mount a successful prosecution. Yeah. Charges wow, have been dude. dropped against every single person arrested in the Murphy Sting. With these claims causing some to believe that the show was more interested in entertainment rather than justice, true. and whether that's true or not, to catch Probably. a predator with one million percent, canceled, marking a tragic end to one of the strangest yet most compelling TV shows ever to be broadcast, thanks solely to this grim moment. Damn. Why do they even like keep that footage? Is that unreleased or they, did they say they published it or what? 
Killers on TV. As next evident one. by the first batch so of cases song in this Ashley video, Link's that correct? Yeah, the yeah, that's correct. moments in TV history come from shocking accidents or overall disturbing events <laughs> that play out for the cameras to see. However, there are very common few problem with ectoplasm. Where gonna television be honest. moments only really become dark long after they're aired, and more context is given. For example, that's why, like, when you, that's why, like, people usually don't stay Notice in motels because, like, that foreign clip with the girl in the car. Remember that. Like, I'd recommend never staying in a motel because a lot of motels, like, I feel like there's a lot of like sexual offenders. At least in my, like, but from my experience, I've always seen like people, like, a lot of sexual offenders live, usually live in motels. Uh, you know what I mean? Like the motel sixes and whatnot. So I definitely stay away from the motels, guys. You know what I mean? That's usually where you'll find a lot of the recovering ones or people that got out of jail or prison or whatever. First installment of the series, we discussed... From your experience? Is bro good? Yes. I, I Okay, from my, my experience is, is bad, bro. What I'm saying is that... Uh, um, that, uh, yeah. A lot of people uh, that live yeah in motels, in my area, definitely, there's a lot of, uh, you know what I mean... There's a lot of those types of people, some delinquents, some some past criminals, you know what I mean? Some people with a lot of things on the record. Uh, notice how they keep showing that forward clip with the girl in the car, remember that? Okay, I remember it. I locked it in my brain. It's locked in. Chad, you guys know your brain is like a sponge? Yo, holy shit. Yeah, buddy. Lightweight, lightweight. For example, is that in our Ronnie first Coleman? installment of the series, we discussed Renard Spivey. Ask him he's been married for how long? Oh, look at him though, he looks This mad. guy's jacked. <laughs> That's fucking ripped. I know, he looks like Ronnie Coleman in his fucking prime. You know Ronnie Coleman was a bodybuilder and a, and a police officer? Bernard Spivey accused of killing his wife, 53-year-old <laughs> Patricia Spivey. Yo, that guy was fucking pissed. Holy shit. We gotta rewind this. Oh, look at him though, he looks mad. <laughs> he just killed his wife into the series they're aired and more context is given for example in our first installment of the series we discussed renard spivey ask him he's been married for how long over 27 years. Over 27 look at him though he looked mad that's explanation of the first dpt don't look 63 year old Renard Spivey accused of killing his wife, 52 year old Holy Patricia shit. Spivey, after an argument that turned deadly. The man who had murdered his wife years after making an appearance on television, with one joke at his expense during this time aging like milk. The concept of killers finding their way onto TV is one that I've recently become fascinated by, with the case always being brought up in tandem with this conversation being the dating game killer. In 1978, a man named Rodney Alcala had found his way onto the popular show The Dating Game, earning a date with Cheryl Bradshaw above all other contestants. However, this date would never actually materialize, as upon meeting him away from the cameras, Cheryl found the man to be creepy and ultimately <sighs> declined to speak with him any further. And as Damn. it turns out, Damn. that decision Brother has no game. life. During the time in which this episode was shot and aired, Rodney was in the midst of a massive killing spree, ending the lives of at least eight people that we know of. Though many claim his true number of victims is shockingly... Did you know that there are more pedophile arrests in the US alone than deaths by sharks worldwide? That makes sense. Wait, worldwide is kind of crazy, though. Guys, where are sharks located? Where are sharks located at? Not just beaches, but like... Are they usually shallow water? Rewind ...was the shot and air and ultimately declined to speak with him any further. And as it turns out, that... Wait. Guys. Guys. Never mind. Decision may have saved... Shocks are in the water? Life. Oh, shit. During the time in which this episode was shot and aired, Rodney was in the midst of a massive killing spree, ending the lives of at least... Holy shit! He was in the middle of it, bro. He, he literally, he literally did it. He completed a side quest. Brother completed a fucking side quest. Time in which this episode was shot and aired, Rodney was in the midst of a massive killing spree, ending the lives of at least eight people that we know of. Though many claim his true number shit. of victims is shockingly closer to 130, due to the fact that they had found a stash of over 1,000 photographs detailing women, young boys, and men that Rodney had taken, many of which are believed to have been unidentified victims of him. 
And what makes this all the more chilling is the fact that Rodney had told the show that he was a photographer, and it was even mentioned during the program. What the hell? Actually, number one is a successful photographer. American Psycho IRL, you think so? Is this actually? Room at the age of 13, fully developed. Given the shocking nature of this case, Each it's really no wonder why it's become so popular, especially here on YouTube. But surprisingly- Wait, he killed 130? It's about eight killed to 130 killed by him. Oh, it's that's the range or tell one of the first crazies look at his eyes. There are quite a few examples of killers finding their way onto our TV screens that have happened within the past decade alone. And one that even happened within Wait, no just way. days of writing this script. One obscure example comes from the show Celebrity MasterChef, where in the background, we can see an inconspicuous man serving food cooked by the contestants of the show. The, the man was one of a dozen unnamed chefs, just helping out typically out of view of the camera. But for this one split second, and likely to the recognition of no one, we see him. This man's name is Stephen yeah, Port, Steve Harvey a 40 year old up? living in South London, who has since come to be known as the Grinder Killer. Stephen is responsible for the deaths of four men he met on the Grinder app, all of whom he had lured to his flat and poisoned with fatal doses of GHB, before going on to violate and then dump their corpses. With these murders transpiring not long after this fleeting moment, I don't moment get these people, bro. You know how many people just want to be violated? You know what I mean? You don't have to do all this. They'll, they'll probably let you drug them and violate them. You know what I mean? Consensually. And you don't have to dump them. Just dump them off at their place or something. You know what I mean? Like, you don't have to go through all these steps, buddy. What the hell is wrong with everybody? Cast for the world to see. Making me wonder just how many other killers have appeared in glimpses on TV that have not yet been... Never dating on Grinder again, bro. <laughs> I don't... What? Recognized. Okay. Maybe they were walking in a crowd or panned over at a sporting event, hiding in plain sight. But killers don't just get shown as background characters Real or as one-off contestants for just a single episode. Sometimes they but are people who suffer from in the psychopathy show's history. telling them not to kill is like telling an anxious person to not be anxious. Forehead, just don't be angry, anxious. Yo, uh, you think so? You think people are like, yeah, you might be right. You might be right. <sighs> Braden, you're, you're on to something. You're on to something, pal. Three. In the summer of 2020, Food Network began airing a season of Worst Cooks Wait, in America. Wait, 2020? Holy shit. One of their more popular shows. And this one was set to be a big one, as it marked the program's 20th season. The competition was all in good fun, with lots of humorous and memorable moments, leading to the eventual finale on the 2nd of July. And in that episode, the fan favorite, Ariel Robinson, would take home the crown as winner of the show along with a grand let's prize of $25,000. That's huge. However, if you were to look for this season today, let's say on demand, on streaming services, or even on TV, you would be left with no results, as Damn. its existence has been practically wiped from the face of the earth. And Maybe given why. what happened after the season ended, this comes as little oh, surprise. Shit. She went to court. Upon winning the competition, Ariel Robinson settled back into her normal life with her husband, Jerry. And after securing life-changing funds from the show, the couple made the admirable decision to foster a young girl named Victoria, whom they eventually decided to officially adopt in January of 2021. On the 6th of the month, just over a week before the adoption was set to be finalized, Ariel would take to Twitter to boast about her parenting, stating, I'm a- Yeah, ectoplasm. Bro. This is like, uh, the most dang- This is like some quote out of like the most dangerous game or some shit. I'm a bear and I'll do anything to protect my children and make sure their futures are equally bright. A statement that seemed in line with her already stellar reputation as being a fun-loving, good person who dedicated her life to loving her kids. Mm. However, no one could have imagined the devastating turn this family was heading for. Oh shit. Five days after Victoria's adoption, Ariel's husband, Jerry, would dial 911, stating, You have an emergency. Our daughter is um, not is unresponsive. She's drunk a lot of water. We're trying to pump the She's already out. Our three-year-old daughter is choking on water right now. Your three-year-old daughter is what? Choking on water right now. We need help immediately. Okay. I can, we can help on the way. Yo, they told her to drink all this water? What the fuck? I don't know yet. I don't know, but I saw him in court, so... This led to emergency responders rushing to the scene where the young girl was found unresponsive on the floor of her bedroom and was soon after declared dead. Damn. Across her body were countless bruises which Ariel claimed to have been from their attempts at CPR. 
Though bizarrely, during the whole ordeal, her story would quickly change, as she soon began blaming her seven-year-old son, whom she stated had a history of anger issues, Damn. believing potentially he had killed her. Already, something very strange was happening with the situation, and it only became more bizarre when a forensic pathologist confirmed that Victoria had died not from choking, but from blunt force injuries and internal bleeding. Damn. Essentially meaning that her death was no accident. This launched a full-scale investigation into the couple, where it would later be discovered that on the date Yo, before her death, Victoria had gotten sick at church, causing Ariel to undress her and make her walk out of the building in just her underwear. What the telling hell? Telling her, oh, you're cold, you're cold. Girls that make themselves throw up deserve to be cold. This anger seemingly boiled over the next morning, where, ironically, Victoria was refusing to eat pancakes that Ariel had cooked, which led to Ariel grabbing her, dragging her up the stairs, and beating her with a paddle. What the hell? According to Jerry, who was working in the backyard at the time, he could hear the beating from outside, claiming that it lasted almost an hour, though he didn't. What? No, bro. <sighs> this is what I feel like when, you know, when, when we find out, like, when they fa finally figure out that, like, vaping is, like, horrible for you, and, like, that it's causing permanent scarring in your lungs, and they link that shit long term, and everybody has to quit, and they ban them. Like, you know, this is how I expect, like, Nick Fiends to be. Every single one of them. Nothing to stop it. And as a result, Victoria began to bleed internally and later would pass away due to the traumatic injury she had suffered by the hands of her soon-to-be mother. When it was all said and done, Ariel Robinson was arrested and will now spend the rest of her life in prison so soon after her triumphant win on Worst Cooks. Since the news initially Damn. broke on this, the entirety of season 20 has been removed from the internet and has been wiped from the show's history. That sucks for everybody, though. That's the thing. That sucks for everybody, bro. That was in that. Everybody else should get a second chance, bro. I'm gonna be honest. Like, at least go on, like, some type of, like, another cooking show. You know what I mean? But for me, one of the most chilling moments in Ariel's history on television came... Some people go crazy, bro. Like, some people's goal is just to get on national TV. You know what I mean? Soon after her victory, when a local news station would come to her home for an interview. But now I truly am not the worst cook in America. But she is the winner of Food Network's Worst Cooks in America season 20. Yes, I am putting mayo in a glove. Ariel Robinson lives in... What the hell? We're inside. We see a sign proudly displayed by Ariel, touting her as the number one mom. Damn. Soon after, the same local news station would become the leading reporters on her murder case. Damn. Despite this all transpiring within just a few years, this surprisingly is not even the most recent example of a killer being prominently featured on TV, as news broke of this final example just days ago. In January of 2020, the widely popular show Family Feud featured the Bleefnik family, who would go on to win the episode and leave a few iconic moments in its way. Yeah, well, well we, we, we started at 12 minutes today because we watched some of it last night. So we started at 12 minutes today. Yeah. With the most relevant coming from this man, Timothy Bleefnik. During one of the segments, the question was posed, what is your biggest mistake you made at your wedding? To which Timothy responds with, Honey, I love you, but said I do. Oh. <laughs> not my mistake, not my mistake. I love my wife. <laughs> Wait, what? Wait, what? The Bleefnik family name local news station would become the leading reporter for years. This surprisingly is not even the most recent example of a killer being prominently featured on TV. Yo, Brayden, this is why Steve Harvey was on it, brother. As news broke of this final example just days ago, in January of 2020, the widely popular show Family Feud featured the Bleefnik family, who would go on to win the episode and leave a few iconic moments in its wake, with the most relevant coming from this man, Timothy Bleefnik. During one of the segments, the question was posed, what is your biggest mistake you made at your wedding? To which Timothy responds with, Honey, I love you, but said I do. Wait, that's so crazy, guys. Imagine seeing that on national TV. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Not my mistake. Not my mistake. I love my wife. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for that, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> 
If you've seen the show That's before, bad. you know that this type of humor is the norm, and jokes like this are made in virtually every single episode. But this one would later take on a much more sinister tone. It was bad when even Steve Harvey didn't laugh. I know. <laughs> oh, due I know. to the events that unfolded not long after the show had aired. Around a year after Timothy's moment in the limelight, he and his wife Rebecca would actually separate, not officially divorcing, but living in separate homes and seemingly not getting along either. Damn. As it was recently revealed that Rebecca had filed for a restraining order against both Timothy as well as his father, a clear indication what that she believed her life was in some sort of danger. Fast forward to February of 2023, and the two were finally making headway on finalizing an official divorce, before on the 23rd day of the month, Gunshots rang out from Rebecca's home. Oh, no. Police say 41-year-old Rebecca Bleefnik was found by a family member Thursday. Police say she had been shot multiple times. When police arrived on scene, Rebecca was sadly no longer alive. And it wouldn't take long for investigators to turn their sights on Timothy. On March 13th, police would arrest the now 39-year-old in connection with his soon-to-be ex-wife's death charging him with two counts of first-degree murder and Dude, blaming holy him shit. for the shooting that took that place at her to home. Guy. With his mugshot- Dude, the divorce ruined him. His wife left him for a stupid joke. Should have never said that. Not showing him as completely unrecognizable to the man we saw on TV just years before. The whole situation is incredibly disturbing. And what makes it even worse is just how beloved Timothy and his family were in their hometown. I mean, they literally had community watch parties to cheer on the family that can still be found here on YouTube. Damn. Listen, it was so much fun. I'm so happy and appreciative of the support community, so thanks. Making the events soon to come all the more tragic. And given everything that's happened since the show aired, and since Timothy said this iconic joke, I think it's very possible that there was at least some truth to his words. Damn. Oh, shit. That's Our final last entry one, guys. takes us to the tragic passing of 15-year-old Yoandra Martin back in November of 1992. The young girl had recently discovered that she was 13 weeks pregnant, much to the disappointment of her family, and subsequently ended her life as a result, which hell? momentarily thrusted her parents, Maritza Martin and Emilio Nunez, into the public eye. The two had been separated since before she was even born, with Maritza gaining full custody, something that Emilio would later claim she had used to keep his daughter away from him, as the two supposedly spent very little time together. As a result, Nunez began publicly blaming Maritza for the death of their daughter, claiming that she and her new husband had been abusive towards her and had even struck her upon discovering she was pregnant. Making matters worse, Nunez would go Damn. on to allege that Maritza never even told him that their daughter had died and had only found out an hour before the funeral from a friend. Now, I want to stress that there is absolutely no information I could find to fully confirm any of what Nunez was claiming, and with many elements of Nunez's story, the jury is still out. Though in his own mind, this truly seems to be what he believed. And this is where the dark side of television began to rear its ugly head. Let's see. Let's see it. For whatever reason, the news station Okorio Asi had decided to cover Emilio's allegations against Maritza, seemingly taking Guys, his word at face value. I don't know Spanish, but so his last name is So, right? Because it's Asi. Asi equals So in Spanish, in Espanol. So, and launching cool a full-scale story into the case. It started with Emilio being interviewed by a reporter from the station named Ingrid Cruz, which transpired in the vicinity of his daughter's grave. During the questioning, Ingrid would ask him things like, what would you tell your daughter if she was still alive? And how did you feel when you saw your dead Damn. daughter in the casket? Her questions were clearly crossing the line, and things would only get worse from here, as while they were filming this segment, Maritza herself had arrived on location to Yuandra's mm. final resting place. Doña Maritza. I never thought about like that. Mr. Brady. Upon her arrival, Nunez immediately removed himself from the situation, and Maritza was instead swarmed by crews who began bombarding her with questions, each of which were ignored, as she clearly was uncomfortable and didn't want to speak to the cameras, and was just trying to get to her daughter's grave. Saber por qué, la reacción, el por qué, 
This has to be it's considered clear harassment. That tensions were rising by the second, as it seemed apparent that Cruz was clearly attempting to provoke her into any sort of reaction, until suddenly, the unthinkable happened. I know, B. It is crazy. This is no bueno. This is muy mal. Muy mal. In a split second and out of absolutely nowhere, we see Nunez charge back into frame. As though he initially appeared to be doing the responsible thing by walking away from the conflict, he had instead actually returned to his car with the sole purpose of retrieving his pistol, which he would then use to shoot Maritza over and over and over again, all while the camera was still rolling. <laughs> shot a woman possibly coming after us he's psychotic man where am i what funeral home am i at Como se llama esto? where am oh, i at shit. <laughs> wait so he killed like the the, the, Rita the would mob? be shot a total of 12 times and in turn her life would come to an end as nunia stood over her yelling i should have done this a long time ago when the smoke cleared Nunez would be arrested and sentenced to life with a possibility of parole in 25 Damn. years. And what's most frustrating is just how avoidable this really seemed to be. Maritza herself had actually requested a restraining order against Nunez not long before her murder, but was surprisingly denied, as police stated that it would only anger him more. With this happening despite sure. the fact that police were That's already tough. well aware of Nunez's violent temper, as authorities were literally called on scene for Yuandra's funeral, as Nunez had threatened to kill other members of the family. He was obviously a very troubled man, who following the loss of his daughter, needed help more than anything. Yet even after all this, this one news station decided to not only platform him, but to provoke him, right before the two had crossed paths leaving us with one of the darkest moments to ever transpire in the history of television. Mm. I just wanted to let you guys know that I have yeah, the lesson. Yeah, no, these guys take it way too far, Bean. That's the thing. Like, at least people, like, <laughs> sensible people, like, know when they cross the line. These guys have no idea. Okay, let's check the Discord. Check the Discord.